Hey guys, welcome back. Skitzone series episode 24. Topic today is going to be rendering three dimensional shells or solids using triangles. So it's not a very complicated topic. There are a lot of steps, however, um, but I'll give you an example of what we're going for. Uh, this is example 24D, just a cross rendering. You can see each face, well, each side has different colors. So front, left, right, top, back, bottom, all the different sides have different colors and it renders pretty well, uh, pretty good uh, frame rate, not so bad. So the goal today is to basically go through the steps of how you render a body like this or a scene of bodies like this. Okay. So yeah, I guess first is to know that all surfaces, all shell bodies can be decomposed into constituent triangles. Um, so for example, you had a cube that's six square faces. You can break each square face into two triangle faces. So you'd have 12 triangular faces. That's the first step of this process. And so, yeah, if you can render triangles in 2D, you can render three dimensional bodies essentially. Um, however, we never covered rendering 2D triangles. We did cover rendering three dimensional wireframes I think it was two episodes ago. So um, all the math is the same in, in that regard, but we will talk first about how we are supposed to render two dimensional triangles. So the algorithms are you know diverse for this. You could find plenty of them online. This I think is the best and easiest one for our application. Um, and it's implemented in the set triangle function in our code base. Uh, the way this works is basically you have a triangle and then you first you have to order the vertices in some kind of vertical sense. So either top to bottom or bottom to top. So this will be vertex one, two, three, for example. And then what you do is you break the triangle at vertex two. So you basically cut the triangle in half so you have a flat bottom and a flat top triangle right here. So you have a triangle on the top and a triangle on the bottom. Then what you do is starting out of the top or the bottom, you compute the slopes of those sides. So for example, this slope and this slope. And that you get just by subtracting the X and Y components of the two extrema of the line segments. Then what you do is you just kind of trace down those slopes and draw a bunch of horizontal lines at every pixel like you see here. And you do that from your starting vertex to your middle vertex. In our case, vertex one to vertex two. And then at vertex two, you recompute one of your slopes because the other slopes stayed the same. And then you continue down the line until you hit vertex three. So it's a very simple algorithm and uh, it's not too math intensive. There are some special cases. For example, what if vertex one, or let's just say, two vertices have the same Y coordinate. So you either have a flat top or a flat bottom triangle. Well, in that case, your problem gets easier by half, right? You don't have to worry about the second half of the triangle, but either way, you have to handle that case more or less separately. Okay, cool. So now that you can render two dimensional triangles, how do you extend that to 3D objects? Well, the algorithm is pretty straightforward. First, you have to break your body into vertices. We already have the idea of this from our previous episode about rendering wireframes. Um, but in this case, let's say you had these vertices, vertex zero, one, two, three, all the way to seven. What you do is, so let's say you have a triangle here at vertex zero, vertex two, vertex one. And also you have one at, let's say, vertex six, vertex five, vertex seven. For each triangle that you have there, all 12 of them, you have to project all those vertices in the 3D sense onto the two dimensional view plane and then just draw that triangle. So in our case, let's say you picked this triangle V0, V1, V2, you drew that with the algorithm above, then you pick this triangle, uh, triangle V5, V6, V7, and you drew that one with the algorithm above. Right? You do that for all 12 triangles. And that would be it, right? That that would satisfy a 3D rendering. It wouldn't be a very good rendering. And why is that? Well, 
because you'd have a catastrophe. Basically, you have no semblance of which triangle should be drawn first, second, third, fourth, or last. And so you may accidentally draw triangles from the foreground before drawing triangles from the background. And that would mean that you'd have like this weird, you know, modern art looking rendering of faces showing through faces that, that ought not to be showing, essentially. And so to get around this, there are a couple different ideas, and I recommend you try to brainstorm some, but the one that, well, actually the two that we're gonna implement, I'll explain here. The first one is both to solve that problem, but also to help performance, and that would be to only render triangles that are facing towards you, or in other words, facing in the opposite of the way that you are looking. And so this requires some more definition on our part. And basically what you have to do is think about the numbering system as an encoding for the direction of the triangle's face. So in, the, in our case, we're using anti-clockwise or counterclockwise vertex numbering. What that means is basically vertex zero, one, and two, they wrap counterclockwise around the triangle and then the normal points in that direction with the right hand rule. Or alternately, you can take the vector from V0 to V1 and from V0 to V2. If you cross, take the cross part of those, the normal outward of that sweep would be the, the normal vector. Um, and then you only would draw this triangle if that normal vector opposed our view direction. So if you see, this is our view direction, you would only draw this triangle and not this triangle because the first triangle has a component opposite of our view direction, whereas this one does not. How can you determine that mathematically? Well, use the dot product. So if the dot product of that normal cross product and our view direction is less than zero, you can draw the shape. Otherwise, skip it. So this would enable us to basically add a line right here in our algorithm, just check if that triangle is pointing the right way. And it would result in half of these triangles not being rendered. So it would speed up our rendering, but also solve part of our problem here, but not all of it. But it does require additional work on our part. Now we have to encode, we have to pay attention to the order of the vertices when we encode the faces. So now we have to encode this triangle on top as V0, V2, V1. We can't call it V0, V1, V2. That would be a clockwise numbering scheme. Okay, so that will help us with the rendering speed and also the problem that we had, but it still allows something to go wrong. So basically it will make it so all of our convex shapes individually will look okay. So you can draw a red cube, you can draw a yellow cube, you draw any kind of cube with its own colors, you know, different colors, different sides, that's fine. And it will always work out fine. The problem is if you try to overlap these two convex shapes, you know, in front of you like this, there's a possibility that if you still render the, the closer convex shape before the further convex shape, you can still get the bleed problem that we had before. So if, if you render this foreground red body before you draw this background yellow body, obviously the yellow will show through. So you can't have that. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Um, one little pro tip, not all bodies are convex. Convex basically means, does a body have an indentation or a depression in it? Um, so for example, the cross I showed you before is not convex. Neither is, uh, you know, Patrick Star. However, if you wanna be clever, you can cut up most bodies into like more or less convex shells um, with holes in them, but that's fine. And basically you can draw each individual convex body separately and that would solve some of the problems with non-convex shapes. However, the second optimization that we're gonna implement is going to be kind of a way to address this problem here. And what we do is we take the centroid of these objects. So if this yellow object is basically further away, the centroid of it will be, you know, 100 meters away from us. Whereas this red object would be, you know, 10 meters away from us. 
So what we do is we order the objects from furthest to nearest and render them in that order. And that's it. So that basically solves almost all the problems. You can still have some problems arising from near objects to each other that they're the same, the same distance from away from you. That may still be a problem, but um, most problems will be resolved in this fashion. And we'll go through how that looks in the code today. So let's do that. I have four examples. One, I'm covering points, which is more or less irrelevant. Um, we'll cover 2D triangles. We'll cover 3D triangles with both the improvements I discussed above. Okay, let's do that. So in the the code, we have four examples here, 24A, B, C, and D. Let's check out 24A really quick. So what is this one? This one is rendering points. So not really relevant to what I talked about in today's episode, um, but still an important thing for us in the future when we go to use this for CAD or FEA and want to be able to identify different nodes of our model or points on our model. This will help us do that. And I'll show you the code for this. It's basically what we did in episode, I think, 22. Um, the very, very similar, at least. So uh, if you recall from before, and even here, we have these edge structures. So this edge geometry that has encoded inside it the points and edges that compose the wireframe for that cross. Well, in a similar way, we have a point geometry structure that embeds just the points, as well as the kind of rendering you want to have. So I just showed you those triangle points. I can change those triangles to be um, circles by changing this four to be a one. And if I run this, you'll see that now those triangles have become blue circles. So not too complicated, not too relevant either. I'll skip this one. You're free to peruse the code at your leisure. Example B, this is going to be the 2D triangle rendering. So this is the implementation of the algorithm I discussed before. Let me show you the algorithm again just to refresh your memory. This algorithm here is implemented by what I just showed you. So uh, quickly, I want to point out, if you can see it on your resolution, I have some white dots here pointing toward the vertices. That's not part of the rendering algorithm. That's just part of my check to make sure that the triangles were in the right spots. But yes, so this algorithm does drop the triangles in the proper locations. And I, I'll show you the code really quick. So in this case, I have this set triangle function, which is valid for all bitmaps, not just screen renderings. Um, and you have to pass in just a couple things. You pass in the usual stuff, the pointer to the, ver the, the pixel information. You, point, you put the color you want to draw the triangle in, the dimensions, dimensions of your image, as well as the six um, values. So you have the three vertices, X and Y location on the screen passed in R8, R9, R10, R11, R12, and R13. So down here you can see how it's working. The red triangle here just, uh, you pass in the frame buffer address, pass in the color you want, in our case red, pass in the six values that define the triangle, X and Y for each vertex, and then execute that function. So yep, again, that drew those triangles. So that's the basis for our entire rendering in this entire series, is drawing triangles like that. Uh, okay, that's simple enough, 24C. Now this, I will, I will, sh I will say, before I run it, um, this does not include, and I'll even show you, both of those optimizations. I want to show you each step along the process. So this one will have a, a glaring flaw to it. Um, so basically this does not include any idea of 
centroids like this. But it does include culling all triangles that are facing in the same direction as you. So I'll show you how this looks. Here you can see kind of the problem that we were talking about. So I have this cross is 30 some odd triangles that construct it and I've got them all set up with normals pointing outward from the cross. So I'm only drawing the, the triangles on the faces that are pointing toward the viewer. However, you'll notice that you know problems like this arise here or like this arise here where this face is facing me as well as this face is facing me. However, even though this face ought to be drawn after this face is drawn, the way I've set it up, it's not the case. This is one giant non-convex body, and so you have issues like this manifesting, where you basically have bleeding through just because of the way I've numbered these faces you know, on my end randomly. So it doesn't make sense here, but it does make sense here. You know what I mean? So how can we address this? Well, like I mentioned before, with you know the Patrick analogy, we can just cut off each individual side or you know spoke on this cross and make them all separate bodies, give them all a centroid, and then basically render them in the order that they are away from us towards us. And that's what the other example is showing. This example does do just that. And I'll show you the code in a second. But yeah, basically, I've cut off the top, left, right, and bottom spokes of this cross and broken them into their own bodies, given them a centroid. And then wherever I'm looking from, at every location around what I'm rotating around the model, I check the distance from the look perspective point to the centroid of the body. And then I order them every single time. Well. If I have to reorder them, I do. If not, I leave them the way they are. But if I have to reorder them, I put them in order from furthest to closest. So very simple problem to solve and a very simple solution to the problem. However, there's still a problem. If you kind of can see it in this angle here, there is, I can even zoom in. You can see here at the, at the top right, I just had it. No, it's a very minor problem, but there are situations where you can actually see through, let me rerun re it just in case. You're right there, you see? At the top right, that blue bleed through because even though I'm ordering the centroids from furthest to closest, there are still circumstances because these are very close together, you know, in the, in the plane of the page, it's still a, possibility that I can get them out of order, but it's very, very, very small in how big that problem manifests. So still a problem. That's why I said there was still like a 1% issue with this. But as far as the computational expense and how much you're getting for it, um, there really is no better way to render these bodies than what I've shown you so far in the video. Okay, so let's go into the code about this one. And I'll show you how this one works. So again, there's almost no includes because they're all behind the scenes. Um, but basically, we've had this in a couple of videos so far. You have our initialization for the 3D rendering, and then you have the loop for the rendering. And then you have to have a cursor. So we make our cursor here, a little yellow cross. And um, so the entire program is this start loop. We'll start label and this loop here. So we just initialize that rendering and then loop forever. But the real you know, beauty of this is taking place in our data structures. So instead of having an edge structure or a point structure or a face structure, like we have in our other examples in previous videos and in this video, we have our, sh it's called a shell list structure is what I called it. And basically this is what is encoding both a number of spokes on our cross, number of bodies that we're trying to be able to order you know, in real time, as long with, along with the pointer to each of those bodies. So here I have a, the top of the cross, the bottom of the cross, the right of the cross, left of the cross, as well as the centroid of that body in space. And of course, you could compute this with math. I just hard-coded it here, but you can make a function that groups these points together, 
takes the average. The problem with doing that is that you may have a lot of resolution point-wise of your feature. Like the average of your body may not be the average of its points. You may have a lot of points. Let's say you're doing a person model and you have a lot of points on the face for resolution and only a few points on the legs. Well, the CG of your person will be in the nose somewhere, but in reality, the CG is somewhere in the stomach, right? So, you know, there's different math that you could do for this, but I just hard coded the centroids of each of those bodies in space. And then, like we had um, before, we have our individual structures that define the faces on the top, left, right, bottom of our cross. And as we had before with our uh, wireframes, if you recall from a previous video, we have all the points defined in space, and now we have all the faces defined as combinations of those points along with a color. And so for example, the top face, the top square of the cross is these nodes, 13, 12, 14, and 15, and we decompose that into you know, two triangles. Um, each of them is, it looks like RGB blue, it looks like. So yeah, that's how this is all working. This is all passed into our Uh, render rendering init function which pulls all this in and I could even show you how that works another key part about this is this value here this structure type so I'll show you how this works really quick um, Okay, so here's that loop function that we just, we're just calling. A lot of includes, you can see it has the ability to rasterize point clouds, rasterize text, rasterize faces, rasterize edges. Every kind of geometric entity we can draw in this way. And the only difference is what we're passing in. And so you pass in that link list of the geometric structures and then it just checks. It checks, did you pass in a value of one? If so, it's a point cloud. Did you pass in a value of 10 in binary? If so, that's a wireframe model. Did you pass in a value of 1,000 binary? Well, that would be uh, just text. We had that in our previous video. Uh, what about a face? So a simple uh, convex shape is just a face. That's 100 binary. That's like example C I showed you before, where you don't care so much about um, the order of things in the depth of the page, but you do care about culling away faces pointing away from you. That would be binary 100. And if you have a list of bodies that you want to care about the order from the viewer, that would be binary 101. And you can see how we can eventually add more geometry types to our rendering. This is how I'm implementing that in assembly. And so yeah, if you pass in the value of one, you're a point cloud, and so it processes that, and it renderizes, it rasterizes that point cloud. Same thing with wireframes, faces, and lists of those shells. So if you have passed in a list of those shell convex bodies, like we're doing, how does that work? Well, you say I have debugging code here. Let's get rid of that while we're here. So the first thing that happens is centroid sort. So it's a function that I wrote the other day that sorts all the shell bodies by the distance from the viewer. So that's obvious, I'm not gonna go into that, that's just you know the distance between that centroid and the viewer. Remember that distance is encoded in our perspective structure here, this look from these three quad words here encode where the viewer is, where you're projecting upon. So you can get the distance between those values and the centroids of each body. That's what this line does. Then it just loops through all of the convex shell bodies and rasterizes them. So yeah, very simple. That's pretty much all of it there. And in doing so, we're able to render a three-dimensional body that's not itself convex, but is constructed from 
convex shells essentially. So yeah, that's the entire topic for today. I hope you found that interesting. It's pretty cool that we can do all this. And I wanna show you the size of this file. It's only 14K, this binary here, 14.3. So that's the entire drawing pipeline in 14 kilobytes. And it could be way less. I did, there's a lot of overhead here I could get rid of. A lot of code in the same spot, well, different spots, but the same code could be cleaned up. I'm not gonna do that. My goal here with the Skitlone series is to make things simple and modular and easy to understand, but you could get this down to probably 8K. Another thing you could get down, and I'm not gonna do this, but you could do this if you cared, is all this stuff down here, let me show you. All these faces, when I'm encoding which vertices are part of you know which triangle, right? DQ 17, 16, seven, that doesn't have to be a quad word. You don't have to use eight bytes to encode the number 17. That could be a double word, that could be a word, that could be even be a byte. So we could get, you know, we could shave off, you know, a kilobyte of nonsense <laughs> zeros from our code if you wanted to. I'm not gonna do that, but you could. Um, at the end of the day, this program only takes 32 megabytes of RAM and what was it, 14 kilobytes of hard drive space. So I'm not too concerned with the the size. I'm not code golfing this series, but you're able to do that. You have the code at your, you know, leisure to do that with. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. That's it. I'll see you in the next one.